Good Friday morning, guys. My name is Jerry Miller, and this is Real Talk with Keith Smith. Thank you kindly for joining us. A pleasure to connect with you from downtown Charlottesville at the I Love Seville Studios on a show today presented by Keller Williams Alliance and our friends at Yes Realty Partners. Keith Smith, a little R&R &R at the beach, I believe, Virginia Beach, uh, with the beautiful 7-8s, Yona Smith. But he was off no to the fear. races. I have no idea. It's hard to keep up with this man. He travels. Uh, uh, it's a wedding. Often. Is that what it is? He, I believe uh, an uncle is getting married. All right, let's go to. Let's welcome the guys. Is that what it is? Is it Virginia Beach or is it a wedding? It's is a it wedding. North Carolina? Yes. Oh, it's not Virginia Beach. It's North Carolina. Okay. It's a wedding. North Carolina. He was at Virginia Beach two weeks ago with me for a KW regional conference. Ah, uh, I gotcha. And then prior was St. Martin. Correct. Okay. Got it. Got it. Got it. Um, Judah Wickhauer has got Quentin Beckham and Lee Elberson on studio. Brothers from different mothers. Gentlemen, Friday morning. How's the week transpired and how has it treated you? Wow, it's been busy. It's good. Busy is good. It's been busy and, you know, if Busy one, good or busy? Busy. Okay. If one more person tells me, gosh, we really needed that rain. <laughs> <laughs> more common, Quentin. More coming. Um, I think I saw uh, uh, an arc and a couple of zebras and a couple of bears and a couple of lions on Market Street before I walked into the studio. Um, Lee Elberson, my friend, what's on your brain? Uh, same thing. Busy week. Uh, we Claiborne sponsors a class in Richmond over the summer, and while I have other staff there, I'm usually there for the first couple weeks, and so it's a two and a half hour class commuting to Richmond every morning, so my day has been sort of starting at 6 a.m., and I don't get to start my actual work day until 2 p.m. So from 6 a.m. to 2 p.m., I'm teaching, and then, as you know, all the meetings get pushed into the afternoon. So, How has the uh, Richmond commute been treating you? Well, I've been taking the Tesla, so it's been super easy. Just pop it in autopilot, listen to a podcast, okay. um, and it's been... Yeah, it's been pretty great for that, for that reason. What um, what what podcasts are tickling the Lee Elberson fancy? Well, you know, I, I feel bad because I have not been listening to Sean Tubbs. Oh, uh, what what's his Charlottesville? He's got a lot of brands. Yeah, he's got so a anyway, lot of brands. I haven't been listening to his. I've been really listening, uh, really interested in uh, any podcast on artificial intelligence, which oh. I think we'll bring into the show today. We'll and, talk about uh, that. Sam Harris is a big one. If you've ever if you've ever heard of him, he wrote several books, including Moral Landscape, and has a lot of controversial discussions about AI and social media and things like that. So. Uh, artificial intelligence in influencer in the Charlottesville City Council election. I'm sure that'll come up later in the show. Quentin Beckham, what is on your brain? Gosh, I don't know. It's Friday. I'm happy I made it to Friday. <laughs> Me too. Yeah. Weekend plans? Uh, it's a full weekend. Okay. A uh, weekend of showings or enjoyable dinners. There's with some work and there's some dinners and and stuffs. I, I, you hang, guys are playing I hang poker. Out with, I hang out. No, no, I hang out with Quentin a lot. Here, I, I'll tell you what Quentin's going to do. Quentin is going to work diligently until about five thirty. He's going to cram as much work as he can get into until five thirty. Then he's going to go to Tavola, right? Happy hour. Maybe happy hour. Maybe yeah. Tavola. Maybe. Uh, Grab some drinks with friends. Something but, bourbon -y will yeah, be in his future. My, yeah, he probably will have a bourbon on the rocks or something. Yeah. And then I'm, tomorrow at about 6 a.m., he's going to wake up, work his butt off until about 2 p.m., and then he'll go meet up with some friends. And then Sunday, he usually has dinner with maybe Elena and Bert. How close am I? I, I would love to meet this person because <laughs> they sound like they could really, you know, get some things done. <laughs> he is a man about town. Ray Cadell, welcome to the program. Thank you kindly for watching us. you got a couple of agents at RE3 watching. Sean Tubbs is getting a plug from Neil Williamson, who is sharing his link, which is the Charlottesville Community Engagement yes. Substack. Yep. And he tags Sean Tubbs um, on the feed. Um, gentlemen, I know you guys have conversated. I know you guys have colluded. I know you guys have chitter-chattered. Alliteration at its finest. The topic du jour that you guys have percolated, I will respond and adapt to you. Well, we've been talking about AI, so we thought we would have an, a, a sort of three-way conversation here. 
Yeah, we okay. have. It, it, so we, I have these questions framed. So I use ChatGPT okay. uh, to to ask some questions so about do, real estate. So do a couple city council um, candidates. Uh, everyone should be using ChatGPT. It's going to replace Google and search engines at some point in the future. So get used to it. Uh, so Quentin, let's start off with. Now I want to frame this for Quentin. So, you have to frame it for the audience. For the audience, okay. So Quentin can be verbose, so we're going to try to frame these answers. Ouch. <laughs> so can ChatGPT. So just so you know, I had to ask ChatGPT to, to frame these answers. So when coming up with these, try to think of in generalities and big picture items and not get too, too buried so don't in, be in the details. Don't All be right, but, but make sure let's localize the content to Charlottesville yeah. because it is the I Love Seville Network and no one really cares about macro content on the I Love Seville Network. It's all Charlottesville. Okay. Centric. Okay, so. So, he, so you're asking, you've asked chat I've GPT asked chat these GPT. questions? Yeah. Okay, so, so I'm competing with an AI. You're competing with an AI that you probably know. I, I would say Quentin's going to give much better answers than chat GPT. Okay. He did so, send me the questions this morning. Okay. Yeah. He gave okay. me a heads up. What's yeah. up, John Blair? Welcome to the program. All right. What are the three main causes of the aff affordable housing crisis in Charlottesville? Oh, I have to go first. Do you want? Do you want Chad GPT to go first, and then maybe you? I wasn't sure. No, 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 no. I wasn't Quentin, sure if Quentin it was. Go first. Quentin okay. Go I wasn't sure if we we're doing it real might, Quentin or synthetic Quentin. Well, it might be interesting to do synthetic Quentin, and then Quentin could correct the AI okay. and see where it's going wrong. But let's let's have you go first this time. Well, one currently is still inventory. Uh, two is still the pandemic and the run up that we had, and uh, three is consistent underbuilding. No mention of uh, the comprehensive plan in Almaro County, only 5% of Almaro is allocated to he development? He said City of Charlottesville, and I did say low inventory, and okay. he told me to not be verbose. Okay. Okay. So let's see what chat GPT says. Okay. So I was trying to be simple. Okay. So uh, chat GPT says the top three are number one, limited supply and high demand. Fair. Okay. Inventory. That's Low inventory. inventory. Yeah. 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 Number two, rising costs of housing. Okay, so that's a that, bad answer. That's, that's, a, not that's an answer. a bad answer. That's, that's a terrible answer. That's, okay. that's, that's a bad answer. Because that's yeah. pretty consistent everywhere. Yeah. Okay, rising rising. costs of housing right. means things are expensive. <laughs> okay. Uh, number three, it says gentrification and displacement. Uh, do you like some details on, on, on what it says there? Do you, do you think that that... That's word salad right there from ChatGBT. That's Gentrific literally where it's Gentrification out. occurs when higher income residents move into lower income neighborhoods. Yes, we know that. Often leading to rising housing prices. Um, in Charlottesville, um, the property values have increased substantially and long time residents, including lower income in individuals, have been displaced. So it uh, doesn't know a lot necessarily about Charlottesville, just what it's read on the internet up until. And what it's done wrong is, uh, is the order. So in gentrification, high income folks move into lower income neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. What we had happen in Charlottesville is lower income neighborhoods became priced so that only high income folks could afford them. And so it's chicken egg. I would say chat GBT on a scale of one to 10 or a letter grade scale gets maybe a D plus with that answer. Quentin Beckham, I'm going to give him an A. Yeah, okay. I, feel much, I feel much more Yeah, I know. You're fine. <laughs> All right. Chat GBT failed with that one. What's the next one? All right. Uh, Elena Mangione is watching. She says nimbyism and density and says, Lee, you and Alex come over to dinner on Sunday. I'm not taking uh, no for an answer. All right. We actually, I think our social calendar might be open. So that's, okay. a, that's, that's, a, that's a firm maybe right there. All okay. right. Um, here's, here's one that's interesting. So what makes Charlottesville special? This is an interesting one. What makes Charlottesville Top special? Top three things that make Charlottesville. Oh, my God. So the problem is this just makes me want to be incredibly sarcastic. Because one is Charlottesville's favorite thing is Charlottesville. That's fair. Charlottesville loves Charlottesville. And yeah. this answer is unique for every person. That it's a small town masquerading as a city. That it has the university. Okay, did say yep, education institutions. So the ChatGPT listed six things that it thinks make Charlottesville special as opposed to. I would like to hear. Yeah, I would please. like to hear. Okay, all right. So number one, not surprising, historical significance. It goes on about Thomas Jefferson and all of the founding fathers. I wouldn't say yeah, that yeah. would be in the top ten if we pulled people on Market Street. Would you, Quentin? No. Yeah, that would not be in the top ten. Okay. Would you agree with that? 
Yeah, I, I agree. That would not be in their top ten. Okay. Yeah. Uh, number two, education and institutions. Okay, mentions UVA and, and proximity to other things. So, yeah, I think that's what you said. Number three, natural beauty nestled in the foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains. Do you think that would be a common answer? Think like hiking and stuff that people enjoy around our area? I would think the answer that people would give, there's a lot of outdoor activities that we can do. Um, I would think people would mention the restaurant scene, the music scene. Number four, strong culinary and beverage scene. Yeah, yeah. strong economy. Number five, arts and culture. And number six, sense of community. Charlottesville is known for a strong sense of community and civic engagement. You want to touch that one? That's, I think that's what he's saying. <laughs> People in Charlottesville love being in, like, love the fact that they're in So I do think if you poll people and say, uh, do you love Charlottesville, the vast majority of them will say yes. Yes. If you make them drill down to why they love Charlottesville, the vast majority of them will disagree. When raising my children, I used to tell them all the time, I want you to always remember you're unique just like everyone else. <laughs> and so a lot of times when we talk about what makes a particular place special, we're dealing with that very concept. And, and it's just a matter of what makes people embrace and live here. We do have a very high percentage of charitable donations. Um, some of those get lost in the competition between nonprofits for the monies. And yet we still are facing problems that are very similar to, to communities that don't have that level of charitable contribution. So I. I resist the question of what makes Charlottesville special because I think a lot of our ongoing issues is because we believe it's special. Yeah, well, I would say... Uh, Blake may Hawthorne has an answer. Where's Blake watching? Uh, Blake is uh, in probably in Sacramento right now. He says yeah. the one of his top reasons that makes Charlottesville special is the global internet talk show scene. <laughs> wow, wow, dude. Blake. Wow. Oh, Blake, way to pick a sentence you knew he would read. Blake, that is hilarious. That Blake is sat hilarious. right there on Jerry's desk when he came He also visit. says, I've been there once the history, the school, and the geography. Uh, Jonathan says, There's not a single person that would mention the history as one of the reasons that Charlottesville is special. In fact, I would argue the history and the ties to it have caused divisiveness in this community. So, ChatGBT is wrong. That's from Jonathan. I mean, that's there's some truth to that. Well, I would, I would say saying he's talking this about monuments. Wrong, yeah, saying this is wrong is like saying anyone else is wrong. This is just some it's it's opinion, and maybe special is not the right word. Unique as compared to every other city in the United States, and I think everyone's answer is going to be different. And certainly, people who've never traveled much are going to have answers that don't have the same perspective as people who have lived in many different cities. I think one of the things that makes Charlottesville special is Quentin touched on, the nonprofit density per capita in Charlottesville is one of the highest in the nation. I think one of the things that makes Charlottesville special is the incredible ecosystem for entrepreneurs and business owners. If they want to come to market, there's tremendous support like CIC, uh, which Lee is very passionate about. Um, I launched mine. You're a business owner. He's a business owner. I'm a business owner. There's just a lot of um, support if you seek it. And a lot of people that are surrounded by business owners, whether neighbors and friends, that are eager to support local. And that commitment to local is not present in a lot of other markets. And I do think one of the things that would probably get rotten fruit thrown at me is, is Charlottesville's a lot of Northern Virginia light. You know, there's, there's a lot of resources that flow down from D.C. and mm -hmm. Northern Virginia. There's a lot of institutions that are housed here. Um, and yet it has not yet achieved the level of density and traffic and some of the nightmares. So for a lot of folks, it's a nice middle ground where you get the best of both worlds. Yeah, I think that's totally true. Um, there's a lot of beautiful stuff. And yet when I go back home to the desert, I'm like, oh, I miss this. This is gorgeous. And so I, I really do think it's a matter of perspective. One of your colleagues, Carly Wagner, my good bad summary of Charlottesville is always that Charlottesville has more education than common sense. Hmm. Carly <laughs> Wagner right there. There's a lot of truth to that statement if you, you want know, to impact I it. You can definitely appreciate that. More education than common sense. What's another chat GBT question? All right. Uh, let's see. Uh, here's wait, what's the question for Quentin. Oh, yeah. Here's a good one. Maybe. <laughs> How will AI transform the home buying process? Uh, it won't transform the home buying process, but it's, it is already working on how you connect. So uh, there's already websites and software and features out there um, 
if you read back through the, I'm going to back up a minute. If you read back through the stats, the number of people whose first engagement in house hunting is online is at percentages that are just ever increasing and way different than it was 10 or 15 years ago. As they've added in AI to help them narrow down that search, you're no longer clicking through boxes of bedrooms and baths and price ranges, and the results you're getting are more tailored to the things you want, and AI and ChatGPT has become a, a part of that, and it's already happening in websites right now. I'll take it a step further. This is how ChatGPT Chat and AI will influence real estate. As ChatGPT and AI become more robust, they are gonna start creating an archive of every unique domicile in America. So when you go and list a house on the MLS and people go and enter and tour that house because they're interested in purchasing that home, they are gonna start, you heard it here first, inputting data on homes they tour, creating a historical archive of each unique domicile in America. Consider what would happen if someone does a home inspection on a house, the home inspection raises red flags, and that person then takes that home inspection that they paid for and uploads it to some kind of AI. That home inspection is then archived in perpetuity, in longevity, forever, for people to reference moving forward. So just like when we get a Carfax report, the car has frame issues, we are now gonna have data on houses with unique addresses for cribs moving forward. And then someone is gonna be able to log into ChatGBT or some kind of AI platform and say, 946 Rockledge Drive, Redfield, south side of Charlottesville. Give me the Carfax. All right, just not to, to discount that at all. That doesn't seem like a terribly novel concept. It's not so happening what, right now. So what is, pre what is preventing it from happening, that, that from happening right now? I is got that answer Regulatory too. issues, like what's? I got that it's answer. It's, I can speak much me, more real than you can if you want me to take that. Well, hey, you no, know, it doesn't sound terribly novel. Do you agree with that, that that's? It's not, not a terribly novel okay. idea. Yeah. But why is it not happening now? Well, I would tell you that it's not necessarily not happening, but it's not happening in the way that you're saying. Um, and a lot of it is, is, is laws and ethics codes that run around that. And the fact that we still believe in homesteads as being private, and therefore things around them are private. And in many cases, it, uh, go on a forum board for some sort of new thing. Let's say uh, you go on the Tesla forums. Mm -hmm. um, when Tesla was new, 80% of the forums went from cheer, cheer, cheer for Tesla to everything that was wrong with it. Because when we are in anonymous groups, we like to focus on negativity. And often the information that it gives, if you were to do this, would be wrong. Because it will get old and out of date and repairs and updates and other things happen. And so if you're going to data mine, the primary focus of data mine is often marketing, lead generation, and connecting buyers to the correct houses sellers to the correct realtors and when you get into data mining for something as complex as a home it's really hard to quantify that so when you look at site aggregators so um, all listing information is public information and if you've never been in the house you can't tell the difference between three houses in a row uh, who owns a lawnmower and who cleans their house and who does maintenance and so the data in and of itself is less useful without the extra details in there that often only come from, at this point in time, a human. And will be the customers leading the charge with this data archive, um, as opposed to the realtors. It will be the clients who go through homes that discover the pros and cons of a crib, that then go and take that information and upload it to the unique profile of that house online for people then to reference moving forward. Okay, a couple of follow-up questions. You took the crystal balls away. I felt like you I should know. have your crystal balls. <laughs> I have. We have many of them. Three uh, of them. What, is there anything preventing... So the home inspection is, is an interesting thing. What would prevent me if I get a home inspection on a house I'm going to buy? Absolutely if, if nothing. I, could I just go to next door and just post it? Absolutely. Okay. Is there absolutely. A, the realtor cannot do it, but the customer absolutely can. Because the customer paid for that inspection themselves. Let's, Let's hear, let's hear from the real estate expert. I mean, I'm the what? <laughs> I do this for a living. <laughs> 24 tenants. 
Um, I think it would be a matter of time before there was something that stopped the practice. It wouldn't take long. Okay. Uh, we have comments coming in fast and furious. Carly Wagner, the engineer who's also a realtor. Insurance companies are already doing this right now. Similar data and reports exist. They pull reports on home data and claims history, but this data is not public access. She believes I am right as well. Uh, I don't know that she said that. She did say that uh, insurance uses geodetics and has for decades. Yeah. Um, and this is why you're having a hard time getting insurance in Florida after the 37th hurricane rolled through. And there are places in California where you're having difficulty because of multiple fires. And so, but... But what she's speaking of is aggregate geodetics, which insurance has done for a long time, versus an individual thing. And uh, you know, we have lots of aggregate data on healthcare, mm -hmm. on, on how to treat a disease. And would you rather not be seen by a doctor and just treated by the aggregate, or would you like something specific to you? All devil's advocate you. I have an uh, eye watch on my wrist right now, and this watch can track my personal health KPIs and literally archive it in the cloud. And I, in my last healthcare appointment, took the data from my iWatch that was archived in the cloud and presented it to my healthcare provider. Of course. Of course. Why can we not take KPI? Why, how can we wear uh, a watch that tracks our personal health KPIs and then uploaded it and provided it to our, our uh, healthcare provider? but we don't have the same concept for individual houses when it's the most expensive investment we will ever make in our lives. It, can I follow up on this uh, for just a couple of things? I think the, the watch is interesting because your doctor probably is not a technology expert and doesn't know what the error bars are. So when it takes your heart rate, at what frequency is your setting set for your heart rate, What's the reliability of that? So, I mean, he has to take that with a, with a grain of salt. I think the Carfax is an interesting thing because that's a major issue. And I don't know a lot about real estate, but if, if something may, like if you- uh, Foundation. A, a, tree, foundation. a tree falls on your house and you have to do renovation, that maybe is in the public domain or maybe you would find out about that. What you're talking about is more of a service record. Your service record for your car is not public. So like every time I took my Jeep to the Jeep dealership, that is not public information, only when it's been in a major accident. And I think what Quentin was saying earlier is that you, it would, it's tricky when you have all of that information. If you give people all the information for everything that's been serviced on my Jeep, they say, hey, what's going on with the tire sensor? And I'd say, uh, five years ago when I first got it, the tire sensor went bad and they had to replace it. So that's out of date. So our healthcare provider, my uh, doctor, watches the program. I can actually, and, and Carly says no, they can actually pull reports not, uh, not only on individual homes, but also individual people. Lawyers do this as well. Whenever a claim is brought, insurance and attorneys can pull a report. I can't remember the name, but it will show if this person was involved in certain claims. So the insurance companies are tracking individual houses. Um, and the unique thing about Carly is I believe she's also a structural engineer. When I went to um, my uh, primary care physician with the data from the cloud, he said that probably one in four of his um, patients are also bringing data from an iWatch to these healthcare checkups. Mm -hmm. And um, a, a good example of this, and you can help me because you have a healthcare background. One of my buddies, I'm not gonna use his name. Um, what's the word? Is the phrase AFib? That's one of them. AFib, when your heart, the BPM on your heart goes real high. Uh, just started realizing that he was uh, having AFib because of an eye watch. And it was not till no. he had the eye watch that he realized that AFib was his personal issue. Um, the, but then what do you do with that? And so I think, I think we're, we're sailing by each other in the conversation is yes, you can provide skilled people with lots more data that informs a process and gives better outcome, but you still need that skilled person at the end. Data in Context. and of itself, and I think this is the, one of the things that currently AI does really well and is also a flaw, it does a really good job of presenting the data as though a human were interpreting it, and yet it's not. It's just compiling the parts and pieces together in a logical framework. And that's very true. Devil's advocate for a sake of a talk show. The AI, as Lee indicated before the show, if we're using a child analogy, is not, you said the crawl stage. Yeah. I think AI is in 
uh, mama's belly right now. Not even at the crawl stage. Mm. I think AI right now is really at the stage of the sperm touching the egg. We're not even in mama's be belly yet. We're the sperm and the egg about to touch. Right I think, I, well, whatever analogy we use, yeah, you could probably judge based on the last few models that GPT has come out with. And between 3.5 and 4, they said it got 10 times better. So, yeah, I think when you're measuring progress in decades like that, you probably are in that infancy. Uh, this is from Blake, who's in Sacktown right now. A question for Quentin. Yeah, Quentin, are you concerned about corporate conglomerate push? and how it could impact um, agents in home buying and selling. Um, I am not concerned with that. I don't want to answer him because I still think you're going to need an expert to help you figure this out. As I say, tell me more. I'm not sure I, I know what you're getting at, Blake. Yeah. Yeah. Offer more insight if you could, uh, Blake in Sacktown, California, and happy to relay it live on air. I think you're going to still need the guys like Quit and Keith to make this happen and to push the deals over the finish line because every scenario is a unique proposition, right? It's not the same every time. It is unique, and you know, I, I still go back to we, we know money is always an issue. Money, interest rates, payments, debt to income ratio, that's always an issue. And a lot of what motivates, are they coming to arrest you, Lee? They may be. Mm -hmm. Lee's AI idea over here. Yeah. Um, and I, I do think um, a lot of what defines a home buying process as satisfactory or unsatisfactory are all the things that come after that. And data is very bad at identifying those things. Um, and gosh, I love the viewers and listeners. They are so intelligent. It's called the Clue Report, the comprehensive. Um, where did it go? I just lost that comment. Hold on one second. Carly, you're making the program better right now. The Clue Report, the comprehensive loss underwriting exchange. None of this is public yet, nor should it ethic ethically be. But the Clue Report, the comprehensive loss underwriting exchange, is tracking like a Carfax, individual houses. I didn't know that. Did you know that? I did not know that. I did not know that. So if this is already happening in the insurance industry and they're privatizing this data for the insurance industry's personal and financial gain, shouldn't that data be democratized so all of us could get some insight into the data so we can use it to our advantage? Or should it be siloed for the sole gain of insurance advantage? Uh, should or will? Uh, AI is going to democratize uh, this. I don't think so. AI we'll is going to agree to disagree on that. that. Well, it, if you look at where all the funding for AI has gone, it's it's the major players that are funding this, and it's uh, Google's dumping a lot of money in this. And if you've learned nothing from their model, they own that data and they monetize that data. Every yeah, but, big but, company, but like, that data is free. Look at Google Search. When you go to Google and you say, where should I go to dinner tonight for a Thai restaurant? Google is utilizing their data and giving it to you for free. Yeah, but they don't sell that data to third, like it, when they sell it to third parties, they sell it in aggregate. So what you're talking about is I, I think trying to buy that somebody else being able to have access to that data. No, I think, I think what's gonna happen, I think what AI is gonna, literally this is what I think is gonna happen. I think AI is going to become so ubiquitous and approachable that social norms will change. And when someone pursues a home to purchase, they're going to say, all right, let me do my personal study in this house, home inspection, and the eyeball test of me walking through it. And then, just like we go on Facebook and Instagram and write 10 sentences on what we had for dinner that night at our restaurant of choice, we're going to use that same habit and that same behavior and write 10 sentences of what our eye test did when we walked through a house and or upload the home inspection report that the client personally paid for to AI about the crib. And as more people do that, it becomes more the norm and that changes social behavior and social norm. Okay, the first part of that I don't find as valuable. I, I don't, I, I think everyone is entitled to have an opinion. I don't think everybody's opinion is equally valuable. My opinion on real estate is worth nothing. Quentin's, Quentin's opinion on, it's worth marginally, on poker skills, marginally more. on poker skills or education aren't maybe as valuable as mine. And so I, I think when, when people are just uploading their thoughts on a house, that's not as important as a home inspection because that's done by a professional and that data 
I, I think that that is always going to be monetized. But so how is I, that, I don't think it's going to necessarily be easily accessible to the How is that any different than us going to Yelp and saying, I want to go to Citizen Burger Bar for dinner tonight, and there's 10,000 comments on Yelp about Citizen Burger Bar. And then it's up to us to decipher by using our intellect and our street smarts which opinions on Yelp are more valuable than the others. It's the same thing. We're already doing this now. Yeah, uh, so, some people do that. I would say I do that, it every day. I, I would say that Google has added an extra layer saying there's a ton of reviews for this. This is a good fit for your style because you like these these places. And so that's, I think, where the AI lens will come in, not necessarily on. This is a great question from Carly. Does Jerry think that HIPAA will go out the window? The private data and the insurance claims reports that are tracked at an individual level is similar to personal medical records. Maybe there already is an act like HIPAA that, prevent, that protects this data, perhaps covered under, under attorney-client privilege. I do not think HIPAA is going to go out the window. I think what's going to happen is the individual person is going to want democratization of all knowledge as AI and smartphones and technology become more approachable and ubiquitous. And as they become more approachable and ubiquitous, we're going to have more access to knowledge like we've never had before, just like we have right now compared to 10 or 15 years ago. It's going to be the market, the individuals that take control of this. And they're going to do it because the home purchase is the most significant decision we make outside of who we marry. It's going to be the consumer that demands this and leads the charge. Well, the consumer's always been in charge of the market. Yeah. And, I think, and I think one of the things that's interesting, I find two things interesting in this. One, it's really fun to sit back and watch the two of you go at it. It amuses me, and I just wish I had coffee. <laughs> two. I'm like this um, all the time. Well, I guess I have three things to say. Uh, two, in my generation, there was a lot of aspiration surrounding space. And where were we going to be by 2030? And what was going to happen? And generationally, people seemed to have their thing. And we were just talking before the show started about the number of predictions of what's going to happen in 10, 15, 30 years and how they're wrong almost each time. They're all wrong. Almost exactly. 30-year uh, predictions are always wrong. And I think three, uh, AI is very interesting, and yet much of it doesn't really have a social utility. And you talk about consumer-driven items. A lot of consumer-driven items have to do with the social utility for the individual and the community involved. And a, and a lot of what we're talking about is interesting, but doesn't necessarily have a social utility. Insurance has a reason to have a clue report, and you have a new sponsor for Real Talk, we do. Jeremy Rowe with yeah. Goosehead Insurance, That's right. who probably knows way more about the clue report than, than any of us that are at the table right now, uh, and you should talk to him about it. We will. Jeremy, <laughs> I, I'll text Jeremy Rowe. I will text him now. Um, Dr. Shocker, on, first, um, Alex Elberson is watching on YouTube. Dr. Shocker is watching on YouTube. Dr. Dr. Shocker. Shocker? Dr. Shocker 600. That is it like home shock therapy <laughs> treatments? That, that literally is his. Boy, it's. Uh, Dr. Dr. Shocker. Shocker's back. Wow. Remember when we were. <laughs> there? Yeah. Yeah. Doc, the Shockers. Uh, I'll stop right there. Told me it would be tasers. I'm telling you, tasers. Therapy. Dr. Right. Shocker says, boys, Apple is already selling the health data right now. Look it up. Apple is already yes, selling your health data. Aggregate data. Aggregate yes. data. There's aggregate a difference data, between yes. aggregate data and specific data. And I think specific data for the, for the homes. I think that's, I don't see that as being publicly available without a subscription. I think the person who owns that data knows how valuable it is, and they're going to keep that tight. Look at the, look, how about try this to get question? national Think about it like a businessman. Think about it like a businessman. Real, okay. real quick, just yeah. to, you know, yeah. you know this. Yeah. The National Association of Realtors holds their data very tight. Oh, you yeah. try to search not, like that data, it's not easily accessible. The National they know Association the value of Realtors of made and I don't want to speak for realtors, but when the National Association of Realtors made the MLS available to everybody, that was a crossroads for, the, for, for NAR. That was a crossroads for realtor. Because it used to be in a book that only agents had, and they protected the MLS in this book like it was the Bible. Like it was Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Genesis, Leviticus, Deuteronomy. Okay? And then it went online. It's the same thing that happened with the newspaper industry. The newspaper industry initially gave their news away for free. And then now they're trying to come back and monetize it. 
It's the same thing. Now, I'll throw this to you. Think about it like a businessman. No, think about it like a businessman. Deuteronomy wasn't a gospel just to interject that. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the only gospels. (laughs) Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the only gospels. Um, How about this as a business concept, okay? You build a website. Okay, website is such an archaic term. I'm not even going to use the word website. You build a digital platform, and the digital platform says, consumer, I will cover half the cost of your home inspection if you agree to upload said inspection to our digital platform. The home inspection is going to cost you, what is it, Quentin, between $500 and $1,000? Sure, depending on what you got, size of the house, what you're looking so, at. Yeah. So between $500, I've done 17 home inspections yeah. in the last five years. Yeah. Okay, 17 commercial or residential inspections. Yeah. Um, consumer. You can save 50% on the cost of that home or commercial inspection if you agree to upload said inspection into our digital platform. Mm -hmm. You know how many effing people will do that? Here's $250. Here's 500 bucks. Just upload your junk to my digital platform. I would do that in a heartbeat. So would you, and so would you, and so would he. That's called a businessman thinking about it. And then once the digital platform gets enough home inspections on its platform, it's just going to snowball and snowball and snowball and snowball till it's the norm. Maybe. I, I mean, I could definitely think of some counterpoints where if I was, was certain I was buying the house, that maybe I wouldn't want the home inspection public. So, I don't know. Quentin? Jerry's very excitable, and you're very subdued this morning. I'm really, I'm in you such a, a great tea? space. Jerry I had, had too much caffeine, and you had too much coffee I'm in a good morning. space. Yeah. I'm like this every day. I, 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 I think we're talking in circles a okay, little bit. Okay, actually, can, can, I, can I ask you about <laughs> the something? The viewers are that's, loving this. That, that's, that's, sort, that, that's sort of on par with this. So when I asked AI for the how it would transform the buying process, how would AI transform the buying process, one of the things it mentioned was, automated valuation models. AI algorithms can analyze vast amounts of property data and automated valuation models can assist buyers in you know, buying, buying property. How does AI contribute now to the valuation of a house? Does it? Um, or is that just set by the home, the home seller? So, uh, no, I don't, I don't think it's set by the home seller. I think, I think he's talking about the consumer running the market like that just happened, started happening a week ago. And that's been happening for generations. And so often houses sell not just for what they're valued for, but what somebody will pay for them. Mm -hmm. And then you're doing inspections and looking for material defects and other items specific to the property to subtract from that price. And then you need some other sort of fuzzier interaction that involves a human to talk about what's going on in the neighborhood, in the city, in the town. And so all of that varies. And, it, and again, the problem with aggregate pricing is its limitation to just hard numbers. Woody says AVMs are bad. AVM, I believe, is an acronym for automated valuation model. I agree with, I agree with Woody. Yeah. Because, like, uh, we used to never talk in price per square foot. We only talk, started talking in price per square You've foot. You've chastised me about that. Uh, yeah, and I'm going to continue to chastise yeah. you about that and probably multiple other things in days to come. <laughs> it's the businessman in me. Um, because price per square foot assumes it's an identical widget. And there is no such thing as an identical widget. Everything on a piece of property is unique. So does that mean you discount cap rate then? If you discount price per square foot, then you must discount cap rate. Uh, cap rate has specific numbers tied to the use. And it's not a valuation of the, of the building itself, necessarily. Mm, OK. I'll. We'll, we'll go. We'll let that one. Uh, cap rate is, uh, is one that I follow very, very closely. It's, it's a valuable tool. Yeah. And if you made your, all of your decisions based only on cap rate, you would make many bad decisions. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. Uh, my first decision is always the eye test. My second decision is always utility. My third decision is always location, location, location. My fourth is price per square. My fifth is cap rate. Um, I'm working with a client now that's trying to build a, bring a business to market, a pretty sizable business to market in the urban ring. Um, and his primary focus as he's bringing this business to market, which I think is going to be a revolutionary business, is price per square. It's one of the key KPIs where he's building his business model around. 
talking about key performance indicators. And you probably have people here who don't know what cap rate is, maybe yeah. watching, I'll, perhaps. I'll give, let me see if I can give a very. Um, is it income over asset value? I'll give you a very simple so definition in, of cap rate. Our business, I don't know. Is Capitalization rate is a real estate valuation measure used to compare different real estate investments. Although there are many variations, the cap rate is generally calculated as the ratio between the annual rental income produced by a real estate asset to its current market value. Okay. Okay, a, point, a good example is I was sitting at this table two days ago with someone that prop across from me that owned, I would say, $500 million of real estate locally. And the cap, and then I had two other folks. We were nego talking negotiations here, and the cap rate came up. And he said this. In fact, I can read verbatim what he said without spilling the beans. Um, he said, um, "A 5.5 cap rate is stiff. I can get 4.5 percent tax-free on my bonds right now." Well, because cap rate doesn't necessarily have to be attached to real property. It's an annualized return based on investment. And so, you know, this, the simplest comparison is a savings account interest rate. And when you're looking at cap rate for a building, you have to subtract maintenance costs and taxes and what's that expe expectation over three years. And so it's a less simple form. It is valuable piece of information, but in and of itself is not a good decision-making tool when that's the only decision-making tool. That's very well said. Um, this is resonating with the viewers and listeners. I mean, we're absolutely on fire right now. I'm trying to keep up with as many comments um, as possible on this. And viewers and listeners jump in. Multiple agents saying they do not like price per square. Um, here's a tough qu Here's a question, though. Thank you. If they don't end up buying the home, do they have a right to publish the data on a home they don't own? I bet home inspectors would fight this and say no. They own the content of the report and are only sharing with the person paying for that report. That's good. Anyone want to touch on that? I'd say that, yeah, the better business model would be for inspectors to be part of an organization and they would license the use of that per, like, as, as a per, to per fee basis or something. It, yeah. 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 Um, oh my gosh, I cannot keep up with this. Um, this is one specifically, viewers and listeners, keep them coming fast and furious, please. I love that you guys are making the program better. Neil Williamson, president of the Free Enterprise Forum, specifically for Lee. How might AI change ed education as we know it for the better or for the worse? Oh, boy, the education industry is due for a disruption. I think any, I mean, it, the education system as we know it is a legacy system built centuries ago. Um, part of the issue is that, you know, the education system, let's t take, for instance, elementary school. You can't just disrupt elementary school because it's tied to middle school, tied to high school, university systems, standardized tests, Virginia standards of learning, all sorts of things. So I think, you know, from my business, tutoring, high dosage tutoring as we call it, which is one to one or groups of two or three, is the most impactful way for a student to learn. It's much more impactful than a classroom setting. So. I think the, the best way to think of it is how can you use uh, an adaptive AI to be able to have a student customize their learning profile individually and maybe a teacher is more of a facilitator. So I, I think the, the upside of having an AI model for teaching education is that it would allow it to be I think much more equitable for students. You know, Quentin and I might both go into a math course and Quentin might be ahead of me. And so we really shouldn't be learning at this, that we shouldn't be learning the same thing at the same time. But at the end of the day, if they say, well, Quentin gained 50% knowledge and Lee also gained 50% knowledge. So maybe we'll base the grade on, on that, that you, you progress the same amount. I think the, downside to any sort of AI learning model is it doesn't do anything for students emotional intelligence and that's a big part of the school system is students being able to, to develop socially and I think the pandemic taught us a great deal on on the effect of removing that that's that social structure for students they fell behind they had a difficult time interacting and it decreased their mental health so I think if we could come up with a school system that would leverage AI, but still give students the ability to, to, to increase their emotional intelligence, that is ideal. And there's a great number of schools across the country right now that are thinking about how they're going to integrate AI next year. Because 
if ChatGPT can write you an essay, uh, you know, maybe, maybe a teacher, instead of fighting it and trying to, to find a way to fight um, plagiarism, is to say, write your essay, feed it into ChatGPT, and tell it to edit it. And look at what it edited, and then, and then rewrite it, and then feed it back into there. And so that the way the student's learning how to, to use experiential learning in ChatGPT. So my long-winded answer. I got a very short answer for you. Yeah. OK, and uh, I'll touch on the plagiarism first. Uh, it, I got caught up in that. University of Virginia, first year. Uh, Lou Bloomfield's How Things Work Physics class. I took it first year, first semester, and first year, second semester. And Professor Bloomfield has a huge lecture hall of five or 600 students. And he said, first semester, you need to write a paper. I told this story on the I Love Seville show. You need to write a paper on these topics. And the topic I chose was windsurfing. And I did a damn good job. And I got an A on the paper. And then I took Lou Bloomfield's class second semester. And he said, you need to write a paper. It's going to be 80% of your grade on one of these topics. And I chose sailboating. Why did I choose sailboating? I give up. Why? Because it's just like windsurfing. <laughs> and I could use the A I got on the windsurfing paper as the foundation for the paper on sailboating. And I went into Microsoft Word. I clicked find and replace windsurfing for sailboating. And then I pretty much just did that. And I submitted the paper. And Lou Bloomfield had. It's actually pretty. <laughs> it's like plagiarizing yourself. Lou Blo That's what I said. How can I plagiarize myself? And how can I plagiarize myself when you're giving me the option to write sailboating when I did windsurfing last semester? And I talked to him just like this, and he said, you get an A. And I walked out of the class. And that paper took me two minutes to write. And he never made that option again. And I'll take it a step further for education. OK, for education. So you juke the system in a way. No, I work smart, not hard. But, and that's what I, I told him. But I worked you, but smart, you, not hard. But did you miss the purpose of the exercise? The purpose of the exercise in anything in life is to get from point A to point B in as efficiently as possible. I, point A to point B as efficiently as possible. I, I think that sort of thinking is what is going to end up being the downfall of, of AI. Yeah, that's a very emotionally right. vacant thing. Okay. Okay. Right. <laughs> Professor hey, Bloomfield agreed. Remove all the... <laughs> Quinn, I took this. Hey, AI, remove... Uh, cure cancer. G done. I've just launched every nuke, and we're going to kill every human being on the planet, and that's the easiest comparing way. No humans, an, no cancer. Comparing an 18-year-old and essay writing to curing cancer is a stretch. Um, well, uh, also, and I'll counter this. I'll counter this. Um, education, this is the concern I would have with education and artificial intelligence. Eventually, there's going to be a Lee Elberson av avatar, a Lee Elberson AI. And that Lee Elberson AI is going to be able to Play poker all day long. Is going to be able to do everything that Lee Alberson can Just do. Just poker. Literally everything Lee Alberson can do without getting tired. Literally everything Lee Alberson can do online, on her phone, on a lens, with goggles, will be able to tap into that Lee Alberson. And then people will be able to go find Lee Alberson on AI and get all the tutoring acumen that Lee Alberson provides clients. I'm sure you've already thought about this. Mm -hmm. This is not novel by any means. The only thing that Lee Alberson AI will not be able to do is perhaps emotional intelligence, at least early. The concern that a tutoring company would have is if Lee Elberson AI exists, why would Lee Elberson, the human, be a priority? Yeah, I guess it, it, it would depend on your value system and how you value genuine human interactions and, and how much you trust the AI given, you know, given the early issues we're already having with AI hallucinations, you know, I, I think it's, it's just a different value system. As humans, we have, a, we have a, a, a shared value system. Now, those value systems can, can differ, but most of us in this community agree that we're not going to randomly go and kill each other. Now, in artificial intelligence, you, it's really difficult to impart a value system on an artificial intelligence without, I mean, you can't give it full autonomy to grow and be creative and also imprint that value system because programming, you know, programming doesn't know nuance in the same way that I think humans are. So that probably will change uh, over time. Because we're, we're agree we're at the spur of an yeah. scenario of AI. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So we're not even like, 
Okay, so, so I agree with you. Right now, the value system and the emotional intelligence piece is not there. I'll take it a step further. Here's a step further. What would prevent a Lee Elberson from creating a tutoring system where it's done in a Coursera fashion, where Lee Elberson teaches calculus through a digital platform for 10,000 people in the world and say, all I need is for these 10,000 people to pay me $1 to enter my Coursera about calculus. And then that Lee Elberson digitally made $10,000 for one hour. But that $10,000 for one hour can potentially cannibalize the real life e. Albert, Lee Elberson charging, I don't know what you charge. I'm just, just call it 225 an hour. Maybe it's 200 an hour. Maybe it's 185. I don't know what charge. Say 90, 95 an hour is where our rates okay, start. 95 an hour. Okay, 95 an hour, one-on-one, -on -one, versus Lee Elberson digitally, 10,000 people all over the world, $1 to enter my class. I mean, I think it's, it, it's probably the same thing in, in, in real estate. Do you want, this AI has, knows, so, knows more than Quentin does. This AI has access to all of this information. So do you want to work with a human being, or do you want the, the AI doing it for you? So you have children. I do. You do. Yeah. Uh, Two. It, Frightens me marginally, but there they are. Yeah, it's unstoppable. Um, <clears throat> who would you hire? Would you hire the one dollar fake person for your child? Uh, we're currently you... spending sixty dollars an hour to work with the fabulous uh, Miss Wilkie, who is legitimately working for an hour with our five-year-old twice a week to prepare him for kindergarten. There's also That's literally happening, and there's some great software and games out for that. Why not choose that? Khan Academy. Yeah, we, it's free. We do do that. Yeah, we also do that. We you do that as well, but why not that alone? As a, because we want the in person, and then we also are supplementing the in person with the digital. Now we're different in that we're you know resource, and it's crazy to say this going into kindergarten that he's doing this. Yeah, just... um, but we're we're so, we're doing bo literally both. We're literally doing both. Yeah, I think uh, regardless of the education level, um, what. What consistently ranks out as one of the highest measures, the, let's say the top three. This is not a chat GPT question. This is a question to non-synthetic Lee and non-synthetic Jerry. Um, what are the things that are the greatest predictors of an individual's success? I don't follow that. Um, somebody graduates, 10 people graduate college, they have the same degree. Out of those 10, what would you imagine the character traits and items in one of them to be as a predictor of success? Um, that's a great, I, I understand. They that. all start the same business. Yeah. Parent, I got parents' income and education level of the mother is the top two, I would say. Okay, I, I would say different. Um, did that individual play team sports growing up? And what kind of level of street smarts and human connection do they have? Ask ChatGPT. And what do the question better than I did? What uh, kind of level of street smarts, team sports, do they, do they play, and do they have the gift of human connection? That's what I would say. Top three predictors. Because I do think emotional intelligence, your ability to navigate social functions, and understanding. That's, is that human connection? Yeah, yeah. 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 I'm just you trying to flesh. That. I'm trying to unpack that a yeah. little bit. Do we want to say for a recent college graduate, or sure. just if for sure. a recent? I would say the three of us have human connection in spades. Because a lot of the things that I think, a lot of what I'm sitting here doing a lot more listening than talking, thank God. Um, <clears throat> what I'm hearing you guys say is a lot of the things that AI does well leads towards certification and degree and knowledge. But possession of knowledge by itself is not a predictor of success. That was brilliantly said. I give him props for that. Completely agree with that. And I think for a lot of that, you're always going to need the human. And so a lot of the stuff that we're really excited about, I think, are great tools. And yes, I do believe consumers are going to push it because currently a lot of ways companies make money live in this sort of arbitrage and we're finding more efficient ways to do that. Computer, software, AI, and big data is going to be a part of that. But it's never going to be the predictor of success for an individual or an individual transaction or business. Also agree with that. I also agree with that. He's basically saying succinctly AI can help you get book smart, but book smart is only going to take you so far. Yeah. That's I what mean, he basically just said. I'm curious what, what the what the monster in the machine said. All right. So when I asked what are the top three predictors of success for a recent college graduate, it said it can be subjective and dependent, but uh, number one, Field-relevant skills and knowledge. 
Interesting. Number two, professional network and connections. And number three, soft skills and personal development. Okay, human connection. So that's, that's three. Emotional intelligence, human connection, I think is probably number three. Two is... What was number two again? Professional network and connections. So I think yeah, that's street smarts. Sort of. That's street smarts. I don't... I, I, that's I who you I know. Disagree. Who you're crafty enough to meet in the street. Can I tell you a story? Here's can, we, a story. can we stop you? Okay, absolutely. You can always <laughs> stop me. You can always stop me. You can always stop me. Oh, how, what are these plugs over here? How, 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 did I, how did I get most of this building? Street smarts of looking at the GIS, found the GIS, and then started taking people out to coffee. That's literally what I did. I said, let me scour the GIS. Who's on the back end of their career from an age standpoint and a retirement with their business? I'm going to take them donuts and coffee, and I'm going to be a pest and get FaceTime. All right, so I actually changed the question and I said, what are just the top three predictors of success? Because I think top three predictors of success for a college graduate frames it in a certain way that they have had the ability to go to college. Okay. Um, so it, it changed it slightly. It said, number one, grit and perseverance. Yeah, is that street smarts? That's, that's, that's street smarts. Number okay. two is directly emotional intelligence. And number three, growth mindset and continuous learning. It's funny, it never mentions in here your parents' income level. Everything I've ever read said that, like, if you pick random people, I think that parent, is the big, that's the biggest marker of success. But, but I think that's a, that's a marker of other things. What does that mean? Um, so a, a, a lot of stuff, a lot of success in life is about access. And a lot of our access is derived by where we're born and who we're born to. For sure. And the random genetic lottery. Mm. What you do with that access you know, um, it's much harder to succeed without a degree than with one, and high degrees are no longer the guarantee of success they were 40 years ago. Yeah. And that's because of how markets have been driven and how consumers have driven the markets and the things that they value. Completely agree with that. I think parents' wealth is being democratized by the internet. And as the internet is making education much more accessible and approachable, parents' wealth is less important. And, and although I don't foresee, I don't share this vision of the future where AI actually supplants humans in these sorts of interactions, I do hope AI, big data, and access to knowledge increases the breadth of access to some of the folks that didn't have the good fortune to be born in a certain town, in a certain country, to certain parents of a certain ethnic or financial background. 100%. 100%. My buddy says this all the time. I think he's watching right now. Dino, are you watching? Dean says this, you don't know how lucky you were, Jerry, that your parents' sperm and egg connected in Naples, Florida, as opposed to South Africa. Mm -hmm. That's what he said. He goes, your sperm and egg connected in the United States of America as opposed to a war-torn country. And something about you saying that sentence just gives me the creeps. I don't no. know what it is. Exactly. <laughs> we can we we get more. United States of America w into a family with resources. So I think, yeah, I, yeah, I mean, I guess that's, that's. We didn't grow up wealthy. Well, but it's also, but relatively speaking. Yeah, yeah to who, South Africa. Who's the comparison? Yeah. Well, even, even probably in the United States. I mean, I think everyone in this room probably grew up with above average resources. And when we talk about generational wealth, that's a, even a bigger deal? Yeah. Uh, what's the next chat, GB? This is great. I love this. This is fantastic. This is absolutely fantastic. Okay. I actually got, uh, I think I picked one that chat GPT was actually wrong on. So this is a, that not real estate. All right, Quentin. I'm so afraid. All right, actually, we're going to ask Jerry. Jerry, what makes the Blue Ridge Mountains blue? I know this answer. What makes the Blue Ridge I never blue? knew this until we, we went on a hike and the, the guide told it's me. It's actually this. a specific thing. Is it? Yeah. Is it? Uh, I have no idea. I have okay. no idea. You know, okay, so you know why Quentin will no know idea. the answer to this? No idea. Because he, he gave might me have the question. 30 years ago. His brother has a photogenic memory, and Quentin probably has pretty close to a photogenic memory. You remember most things you read, right? Uh, if there's a story behind them, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there has to be a story. I wish I had that. So anyway, what makes the Blue Ridge Mountains blue? Well, because it's stupid hot during summer here, and trees to protect themselves release a chemical called isoprene. And isoprene, when it mixes in the humidity in the air and, and refracts, it's blue. The blue fog you see is actually self-created weather by the trees. 
Isn't that crazy? It's like sunscreen from the trees. Isoprene. I did not know that. And it's, uh, it's mostly the oak trees, I think, in the Blue Ridge Mountains that do that. So anyway, ChatGPT sort of got it right. ChatGPT said it's due to Rayleigh scattering, which is why the sky is blue. And that's technically why that particular part is blue. But more uh, other mountain ranges don't. You could globally blue. say refraction yeah. for sky and the Blue Ridge and be correct. Yeah. I love it. Give us another one. Give us another This is fun. Like this? Yeah. All right. Uh, I do like the real estate topic, just because I'm passionate about it. Okay, so I asked, uh, how many first-time home buyers are there in the U.S. every year, as a percentage of, of normal home buyers? And and I dislike this question because okay. it's changed so much in okay, the let's last just, twelve months. But okay, so let's not include the last twelve months because ChatGPT is only valid up until September 2021. You um, know that. I would. Well, it's it's roughly thirty percent, give or take a couple percent. What do you think it is? Ooh, ask the question one more time. As a, per, like of all the home buyers uh, every year, let's say aggregated for five five years, not including last year, what percentage of those home buyers are first time home buyers? Yeah, I don't like this question either because <laughs> over the last over the the pandemic has significantly diminished the percentage of first time home. So buyers. if I was just to give you a ratio, it's generally speaking been one out of three for many years. Okay, it's way less now, and it's in. The last year, it was one out of five. Okay, there you go. So, so that question and, is almost an anomaly. I want to keep it as a fuzzier answer because I'm not 100% certain on the percentage, but it's roughly been one out of five. And how about, a, and, and we have seven minutes for the viewers and listeners here. Uh, a follow for him, the bene, bene, benevolent Quentin Beckham, I would imagine that number would probably diminish moving forward. Would you agree? Or get slimmer? As, as things get more expensive? Um, I rates... think it's going to pick up again. We still have a very strong job market, and we're going to see interest rates come down next year. And a lot of things that are sticking people where they're at for the rest of this year will not be the same. Okay. And I think locally our biggest determinator is what happens with the comprehensive plan, increased density, and the building we do. Because so the you... only way out of this is And I don't see the political to more... capital to expand the 5% development area yet. I don't know. Because it looks like, it, you know, I would think that and Malik's going to win again. I would think that B. Lapisto is going to win again. They have the, the value proposition of being the incumbent. Malik is, what, a four or five term? Lapisto currently is a one term going into a second term. You know, I, and, uh, yeah. So long as we have inventory, which is now at incredibly low levels, and we're talking even over the last 20 years in terms of existing homes on the market, the inventory is very, 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 very low. And that's going to keep propping up high prices and making affordability really hard. The harder affordability is ha affordable housing with a capital A becomes even harder because the gap you have to bridge is so much wider. Yeah. I, I like it. I, I agree 100%. There's, a, there's another study that I find interesting, and I'm curious to see how Charlottesville and the county go through it. If you um, grab 100 people on the downtown mall today that drive into work and you pull them, 62 of them will say they're in favor of affordable housing and housing affordability and would let density happen. If you follow them home to where they live, they'll vote against it. If you, if you poll the state, the majority of Virginia is in favor of more affordable housing, even if that means more density. But then when you boil it down to the local level, that's generally where it dies, right? Dude's all over it. You want to jump in on this? Lee Alperson, and, he's all over it. And I've got right? one more thing. If you look at other states where this has been more intense for longer, this is what has led to states overriding municipalities and taking some of the decision-making about dis density and um, zoning out of their hands. You know how many people, because we talk, we talk housing. You know I'm passionate about this like you, Quentin. You know how many uh, individual neighborhoods leaders in neighborhoods on associations have reached out to, to Jude and I, to me, about trying to figure out how to create an HOA for their neighborhood to protect themselves from upzoning. It's gotta be nearly a dozen. Nearly a dozen have reached out looking for guidance. And I've said, dude, I'm no expert. If you want some guidance on that, talk to an attorney that specializes in HOA creation. And there's many out there that do that. Yeah. But it's to his point, that people in a cocktail party could be like housing for all, except when it starts imp impacting their street and their neighborhood. <clears throat> and all I would encourage people to remember is this. This is not a zero-sum game. 
you know, yeah, there's ways to, to, for people to have enjoyable neighborhoods and houses they like that meet all these needs. It's just, it's not a zero sum game. There is opportunity. We have the ability to make opportunities for others that cost us nothing. There you go. And, and it's not always easy, and it's certainly not something chat GPT could come up with. Um, but it's, it's out there, and it's, there's the potential for it. Three minutes left. Do we have another one? Quick question. Yeah, rapid fire. Uh, how much of a family's income should they spend on a mortgage payment? 30%, no more. Okay. That's, that's true. That's what chat GPT but, says. But what well, is hold it on, now? Hold on, hold on. It's, it's now it's closer to 50%. For well, most. but what is, we said, I said should. Shoulda, yeah. coulda, woulda. Right. Uh, top three factors every home buyer should consider. Top three factors every home buyer should consider. Can you afford the payment? Income, uh, future potential losses, and their overall debt to income ratio. I okay. think that's a great answer. Chad GPT said financial readiness, yeah. affordability <laughs> and long term plans, location and property considerations. And I would tell you when I'm talking to people about the first time, I want to know how long they're going to live in the house. Yeah. And another thing that first-time home buyers should consider is dudes, dudettes, this does not have to be your forever home. Get into something even if it doesn't tip Or your it doesn't have to be your forever mortgage. Right. Just get into something. Yeah. You know, and I think a lot of times a five-year house, treat it like a lease, like you leased a car. That's actually not a bad way to look at it. Or not like Quentin leases cars because he goes through them every six months. I never lease cars. Ah, <laughs> uh, the Rivian has I been more no, permanent. No, the, Rivian, the Rivian's been here almost it's a year. It's over 10,000 miles. <laughs> Dude, <laughs> actually, no, the Rivian's not even a year old. but that It'll is be a year in September. I see the Rivian it's driving. It's relationship. I see the Rivian driving around town. It's dope, dude. I love my It's car. got the uh, cool thing that you've put on the bed of the truck. It's got the, the rooftop tent. We went camping. We went camping. I saw that. Yeah, it was I saw super that. awesome. I saw that. So here's, I, I had we a thought. We have 90 seconds. Okay, I, I had a thought as to this why, is fun. This is fun. why I would want to work with an actual realtor as opposed to having it AI driven. You know, what if you have a really bad day and you're upset and you go to your realtor and you're like, let's just buy this. I have a feeling most people under Quentin's dead would stop and say, maybe you should take the weekend to think about this. Like that emotional intelligence being able to perceive on some. Probably not in this market, but. <laughs> yeah. no, I was just going to say that. Well, really, I got the form to your sign. I was, trying to, I was just gonna... trying to throw you a bone there. No, but, no, no. Yeah. I, the realtor that we worked with, I think, would, would have done that. And I think that being able to understand somebody's emotional state, especially, like tutors do this too, right? Is, the be, is tutoring the best thing for you because you're on the verge of tears right now? It, should you be doing something else, right? Sounds like your grandpa just died. You shouldn't be in a tutoring session right now. Yeah. Emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence is a big deal, yeah. uh, which is why we, and, and we've known this for a long time, which is why we talk about the letter of the law versus the spirit. And we want people that engage in the spirit of the law, that engage in the spirit of commerce and conscientious competition and capitalism, um, as opposed to just the letter of it, because just the letter of it leads to bad things. There you go. 1125, boys and girls. Quentin Beckham, Keller Williams Alliance, Yes Realty Partners. Trust an agent with emotional intelligence. Yes Realty Partners, Keller Williams Alliance. Lee Elberson, Claiborne, all around great guy, embodies emotional intelligence. I love the show when these guys come on. Literally had no idea where it was going to go, and it was one of my I didn't favorites. either, it was so much fun to watch you two. So much favorite. I, <laughs> I didn't get to do that very often. I love it. Judah Wickhauer keeps us online. We will see you on the I Love Seville show in one hour. Take care. On time. Thank you. Sam. I'm going to be late for my 1130. I just can't be too late. Bravo.